Amen. You may have a seat. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and join me in the book of Acts, chapter 8. If you'll find verse 26, we'll begin there in just a few moments. This story today that we're going to look at, it's sandwiched right in between two really significant events in church history. One of those events being where the gospel has broken through a racial barrier and has crossed culture into Samaria. Samaria is a place that Jews and Samaritans, they did not get along. It was a place Jews really didn't want to go to bring the gospel to them. And so in their mind, you know, hell was deserving for them. And, and, you know, if there was a message of hope, then they weren't going to deliver that. And so uh, that barrier has been crossed and Samaria was reached with the gospel right there in Acts chapter 8. After Acts chapter 8, another huge significant event occurs in the life of the church. The gospel breaks through and falls on Gentiles. Gentiles, another group uh, that's just everybody else outside of Jews. In a Jewish mind, it was Jews and everybody else. So they're God's chosen people, everybody else, Gentile. But the gospel has broken through and has reached Gentiles. God raises up a man to, to be that apostle to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10. The apostle Peter preaches. There are six Jewish men that also show up there with, with Peter, and they witness the, the Holy Spirit fall on the Gentiles just like the Holy Spirit fell in the, days of Pente- in the day of Pentecost upon the Jewish uh, believers. And so this story that we're going to look at is also significant. Another barrier is crossed, and our message, our story today, details how the gospel reaches Africa and how it goes into Africa. In fact, an early church father named Irenaeus from the second century called the Ethiopian eunuch the missionary among his own people. Did you know the gospel was meant to break through racial barriers. It was meant to cross all ethnicities. In fact, we see in Revelation, it does. Revelation 5, 9 says this, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Every tribe, tongue, people, and nation will be represented in heaven. The gospel right now is going forth to all nations. Uh, Many are making sacrifices to do that. Overseas missionaries, Bible translations, all kinds of efforts are being made for the gospel to reach the ends of the earth. And God has ordained a way, a method for the nations to be reached. His chosen method is to spread and break through these racial barriers through the witness of his own people. For us to open our mouths, share the gospel, that is how God has designed this message to get across. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, listen to what it says. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us, listen to this, the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you, look at this, on Christ's behalf. And what's the message? On Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That is the message. Be reconciled to God. That is the message being proclaimed through his people. Those who have been reconciled to God are to take that message, how to be reconciled to God, cross racial barriers, cross the seas, the oceans, to, cro- to get this message to be reconciled to God to as many people as quickly as possible, to as many people as possible uh, for the glory of the Lord Jesus. And you'll see today, this message has not been committed to angels. It has been committed to the primary messenger, 
us, the ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. The title of the message this morning is, Here I Am, Send Me. Look at Acts 8, 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. In other words, this is a deserted place. So as we're going to see this message being proclaimed, and as it's going to make its way into Africa, you see the angel doesn't go and fulfill the command on Philip's behalf. He says, you go, arise and go. And you'll see these are quite strange. These are strange commands. Uh, Arise and go to this where? This deserted place. Let me focus on this arise and go. Arise and go means this. Stop what you're doing. These are two commands really combined into one. Stop what you're doing. Get up and go. What God has done through Philip in Samaria had been completed. That assignment in Samaria was done. And so what God wanted to do through Philip, it's over now. He's still going to continue the work there in Samaria, but it's not going to be through Philip. And he tells Philip, this task is over. Arise, get up, and go. Okay, Lord, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go. And you want me to go where? Where does it say? To the desert. That's pretty strange. Especially if you're Philip. There's, According to Philip, you know who's out there? Nobody. There's nobody out there. He doesn't have the information that we're about to get. And so you're going to see God's commands often seem strange on the surface. And you will find as you and I, as we read our Bibles, as we listen to the sermons, as we listen to God's word being taught and preached, at some point what God does is he speaks through his word. And by his Holy Spirit, he applies a message to your heart. And on the surface, it seems quite strange. There's some conviction there. You know that what God is leading you to do, but then all of a sudden, you find yourself in a crisis. And there's, how is this going to work? And then, well, what if this happens? And then some fear, some anxiety occurs, some some worry. What, God, you want me to do what? And I'll tell you, on this side of obedience, it is very strange. And uh, we often wonder, what is God doing? In fact, we'll even ask God, do you know what you're doing? Because based on the commands, it, it doesn't seem like you even know what you're asking me to do. You know, I went back through the archives this week. And I went back through some old business meeting notes. And I'll look back through, and one of the memories I have is I still remember, there used to be a building back here. If this is your first time here, like there was a, there was a building here. There's not any more. But we met in that building on a Sunday night. And I remember giving my pastor's report, and I was saying, look, we have some issues with this building. And here are some options. We can do nothing and just leave it. We can fix it. But these people, these experts have come in and said, that's not wise to do that because you're going to have even more severe issues. And then came the recommendation. We need to tear this down. In fact, we'll also tear it down. And if we find ourselves tearing it down, it'll serve as an act of repentance for our church that we are sorry that we would not reach across the racial barriers that have moved into our community. And if you know the history here, it was built this school for our little white kids here at the time to be protected. South, they saw the handwriting on the wall back in the day. Hey, this community's changing. South Dallas, you know, uh, let's, let's have our own little form of white flight. And we will set up our, circle our wagons. And we're going to protect all our little white kids of this church. And then you'll find in the history, go back in the archives, God took his hands off this place. He stopped blessing this place. He stopped moving here. There are some times you can go back through the archives and there's some little spurts of growth, but overall it's trending down. This church hit its peak in 1994 in every way. Baptisms hit its peak in giving, hit its peak in church attendance and Sunday school, and has not since recovered. 
And what we did and identified, well, this is an issue here that's holding us back. And then we recommended we need to tear it down. And you should have seen the faces in the room. I'm telling you, those commands seem quite strange. Some of you were there and remember it. And here was what I remember. I looked back. I looked at the date. April 28, 2018 was that day. That night we did that. And I've kind of come to the conclusion, I think the only reason why I was able to get a unanimous show of hands back then, nobody thought it was possible. Sure, preacher, go ahead, we'll tear it down. And everybody raised their hands because nobody, I don't even know if I really knew at the time, that that would even be done. So everybody's like, whatever, I'll raise my hand. I don't even think it's possible. And yet here we are today. And maybe you've come on our campus and you weren't around those days, but you come and what do you see? Not a building to the glory of Jesus Christ. There is nothing there. I'm telling you, despite the strangeness, what do you do? You get up, stop what you're doing, and you go. You go and do what God has told you to do. What does Philip do? Look at the first part of 27. I love this phrase. It's very short. So he arose and went. With what limited information he had, he demonstrated what the Bible calls faith. It's what James says, without works, your faith is dead. How do you know Philip believed and exercised his faith? He got up where God was moving in Samaria. The gospel was breaking out. Revival was occurring. And he thought, you want me to go away from all this, God, that you're doing over here? People are getting saved. The Samaritans are being reached. No one thought that was possible, and now you want me to go walk off in the desert somewhere. Yes, I do, Philip. He says, oh, that seems quite strange, but okay, you're God. I am not. And he arose, and he went. Notice the background of the commands. Now, this is information Philip doesn't have, but you and I as the readers do. Look at verse 27 again. So it says, so he arose and went, and behold... A man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Let me focus on two words here, and it's this, behold and wonder. Behold and so Luke, as the narrator, says, behold, look at this. In fact, there is somebody out there in the desert, and not just anybody, a eunuch, a high official who serves under Candace the queen, a man of influence, a man who would be trustworthy. I mean, he's over the treasury. You Typically, you don't put irresponsible people over the money. So they trusted this guy. And here's the guy that they would likely listen to when he goes back home if he's going to open his mouth and declare the gospel. Not only that, you see what it says in the text? He had went to Jerusalem and was returned. Well, why did he go to Jerusalem? What does it say in your text? Why does he go to Jerusalem? To do what? To worship. However, there's a problem if you're a eunuch. If you go on the Temple Mount, there are walls. Walls that exclude Gentiles from going so close. Walls that would exclude women. And then the closer you get, you've got to be a priest. And the closer you get to get into God's presence. And so this man would have only been able to come so far. Not just being a Gentile, he's an emasculated eunuch. He likely didn't get very far at all. Might not even reach the Temple Mount. And so there's probably a little bit of, man, that didn't do what I thought it was going to do. And so he's on his way home. Thinking, well, I traveled all the way to Jerusalem for nothing. But you see what else it said in the text? What is he doing? Reading the Bible. Not just reading the Bible, reading Isaiah. A specific prophecy, a a messianic prophecy about the coming Messiah. My goodness, this man is seeking God. It's not just anybody out there. Even more than that, God is seeking him. You will find people that really want to know the gospel wherever they are, even in deserted places. Did you know God will go to great lengths to get the message to them? 
We don't seek God because we would never find him. God pursues us. He seeks after us. And he does it through willing and obedient Christians. He does it through those who will say, yes, I will arise and go. He does it through those who will say, I don't care about the racial barriers. That's flesh and blood who will die and go to hell. Who cares what color of skin they have? Who cares what language they speak? They are image bearers of Almighty God. They deserve to hear. And so we arise and we go. No matter where he says to go, even if it seems very strange, and it oftentimes does, God does know what he's doing. It's just on this side of obedience, before you exercise your faith, that's where you remain blind. That's where you stay blind if you never do. The breakdown often comes in the process getting us on the same page with God, getting us to join him. Listen to Proverbs 19, verse 20. It says this, listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. You know what happens sometimes in the latter days? I don't need to follow counsel anymore. I did that back in the day. I followed God back then, and at some point along the way, did you know you can get old? You can get really old. You can have white gray, no hair at all. You can just look old and not be wise in your latter days. Did you know that? Being in your latter days doesn't make you wise. Being wise in your latter days means you're still willing to learn. That you're still willing to admit, I don't know it all. I don't have all the information. I do need God's counsel and wisdom. Some people get in their latter days, and although they be old, they be fools. Because they're still living by the seat of their own pants. They're still making decisions what's right in their own eyes. A church can act foolish in its latter days if it stops receiving counsel. Verse 27 of Proverbs 19 says this, Cease listening to instruction, my son and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Maybe for some of us in this room, it's time to perk our ears back up and, and get willing to admit and humble ourselves. I'm in my latter days, and really, regardless of your age, you don't know when you're going to die. You might be in your latter day right now, and you might be young. But today's the day of salvation. And if your ears would perk up today and say, okay, God, you got my attention, I'm listening. And you listen, I'm telling you, there's instruction for you today. God doesn't want to just give you counsel in your younger days. He wants to give you counsel as you walk and go with him. And even to your last breath, he would desire to give you counsel. Did you know that? He wants to give you counsel all the way through. Did you know it's not how you start, it's what? How you finish. Many people have started and maybe done okay when they start. But they don't finish. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. Sometimes here's the problem. We think we know better than God. Isn't that just the audacity of humankind? I mean, it, if God is who he says he is, that he's omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, he's everywhere at one time that you can be. You can't go anywhere where God is not. He's omnibenevolent, meaning he's all good. Your definition of good, ultimately the source comes from him. And then here we are, finite beings. We have birthdays. And we have death days. God does not. And we could say, I know more than God. That is the audacity of humankind. That we think we know. And we think we know in this world that we live in, all there is to know. And then we come up with theories that just Big Bang came out of nowhere and then spun it all. And now it's just going. We can get very prideful. In fact, it's that pride that makes us unwilling to submit to God's instruction. And we act as if we are our own gods and we can do whatever we want to do. But I would tell you this. Faith means you're willing to obey with the limited information and that you would put your faith and trust in Almighty God. And if anybody does that, they will find God does know what he's doing and that he has a plan for your life. In fact, and you'll find this, that he loves you and desires a relationship with you. You know, looking back on that teardown process, there was some background information that we didn't have in that room. 
And that background information back then is what you're seeing today if you're here and weren't here back then. Uh, we did not see that there would be a whole other group called Trinity Love Church, did we? And so here's, here's how crazy we got, okay? If you're new to this process and you're new to like around here, look, let, let me just tell you how crazy we are. We tore down the building, but it didn't just like come through with a wrecking ball. Here's what we said before the church. To tear down this building, we got to take electricity out of this room and put it in this room and pay $52,000 to do that. Because the electricity in this room feeds the other two buildings that are still standing. And somehow, people said okay to that. And we were like, yep, okay, if this is what God wants us to do. But we have no money. And so in two giving days that year, we raised $52,000. Still to this day, how does that even happen? God provided. God provided. In fact, when he tells you to do something, he obligates himself to provide for you. And so you go on his provision when you do arise and go. But then COVID hit in 2020. And then here come the like, well, God, this really seems strange. We've already taken the electricity out. We've already got a little hope that you were going to like do this. And now in 2020, we don't know how we're going to survive. In fact, this church is shrinking and shrinking. God, what are you doing? And then in that process of COVID, we learned there's another church that has a building, but really aren't being able to use it, not really giving them freedom to use it, and uh, a growing church that needs a place to meet. And here we are, a shrieking church with just outlandish buildings, big, large buildings, too much space for us. And it was like this match made in heaven. And it's almost like this, looking back, it's almost like God saw that even in 2018, on April 28th. And he did. But if you don't arise and go, you can't walk in these plans and see all that God has. And so for the people back here that won't willing to do it, they just remain blind, remain foolish, and in their la even in their latter days, remain disobedient, unwilling to yield. Background of the commands. Obey God with what's limited that you have. God has all the information, and it's called faith. It wouldn't be faith if we had all the information. We walk by faith, not by sight, the Bible says. Let me point us to the next commands. Look with me in verse 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip gets out there in the middle of nowhere and he sees there's a guy. He's returning. And from a distance, the Holy Spirit, Philip, there's your next assignment. But what is he going to have to do to get involved in his next assignment? Go near. Go. Overtake this chariot. And you're like, man, is he, what's that mean? Join the chariot. Join your, that you got to join yourself to God's assignment, okay? You can look at God's assignment from a distance, but what God, God desires for you is to join yourself to it. Get involved, and then you walk in God's assignment. But you will find Philip doesn't walk in God's assignment. He runs in God's assignment. Look in verse 30. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? You know how scary that first step is? You like, you go near, all right, there's a guy out there, I don't know him. Should I introduce myself? What do I do? The Holy Spirit's saying, go near and overtake the chariot. And as he gets closer and closer, you know what's happening? That's a familiar sound. Oh, and he gets closer. I think I've heard that verse. Is he reading the he's reading the Bible? He's reading Isaiah. God, you know what you're doing. <laughs> but there's a little bit of praise just in all those steps. And then he asks, he's got to at some point open his mouth, right? Do you know, do you know what you're reading? What, what, what are you doing? He's joining himself. It's scary up front. It's very scary. But I will tell you this, after you take a step, and then another step, and then another step, you know what happens? It gets easier. And all of a sudden, that walking somehow turned into a run. For Philip. 
and he's just running in the will of God for his life by faith. Verse 31, the eunuch responds and he said, how can I unless someone guides me? Wow, Philip, that's why you're here. Do you know sinners don't know how to come to God? It's on us to lead them. And he's asked Philip to come up and sit with him. My goodness, you see how easy it just got? He just got invited. Would you come up here? What's Philip got to do? Yes. Okay. The place in the scripture which he read was this. Now listen to this. This is just gets, look how, man, this is money. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He is reading about Jesus Christ many, many years before it ever took place. And he asked this question, or in his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? For the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself? Or some other man? What a question. Is, is Isaiah, is he talking about him? Who is he talking about in this passage? You can't get a better opportunity than that. Especially when you're called in the Bible, Philip the evangelist. And then what does the next verse say? Then Philip opened his mouth. That seems like an unnecessary detail. Would you agree? I mean, does he really have to say that? Yes, because we have to get involved. You have to, at some point, join yourself to the assignment. I asked JT if he would come on up here for a little demonstration. I like baseball, so, man, we're going to play a little baseball, dude. You just stand right over here. And I got some stuff. All right, JT, I want you to, look, I know there's a bunch of music equipment around, but you have a green light from your pastor, you can swing away. I'm going to write this down in my journal that I played baseball on stage. I'll have another date that I can remember. All right, JT, I, so I do like baseball. And I, if I'm the pitcher, my job really in baseball is to get him to swing and miss. This is a blitz ball. Just raise your hand. Anybody know what a blitz ball is? You've seen the commercials? These things can do some crazy stuff. But there's a piano behind you, and I don't know, man. Let's see. I could just peg him, but don't charge the mound. You ready? You sure? So one thing I can do is this with the, with the blitz ball. Can he hit that? All right, let me, let, me, let me keep trying. I got some more. You hit that? What do you think about that? Was that pretty close? All right. Do you want JT to swing? If, you know, what they could do, if they really wanted you to swing, they could say, swing, swing, swing. Hey, that was, that was pretty good. I think you could have went guard with that one. It'll make it a little easier. Oh, man. All right. Maybe something else? You can't, that kind of lights up a little bit. You should be able to. Oh, that's money. Ham on sandlight. Low on outside, he would have took that one. This is big. You should be able to, no? Football, you swing at that? That was there. That was, that was right there. Okay, we're going to make it easy on him. You, you got, there is like, I'm trying to remove all excuses. I got to give that back to John Luke later, so don't tear that up. There it is. 
Just let her rip. Okay, hang on, maybe I'm doing this. <laughs> you can do it, you can do it. If you want him to swing, tell him, tell him, it's okay. Show everybody out there you can do something more than play a guitar. Swing. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, that's fine. We'll keep him okay. with the music. Here, you may want to take that, that back. But look, did you want him to swing? Did you really want him to swing? At some point, do you know what the batter? I mean, if I'm throwing him at his knees, if I'm throwing him down at his feet, if I'm pegging him, he can't do nothing with that. In baseball, this is the term I like. Some, some people call it cheese ball. I call it a lollipop, where it's just like, there it is. Just, just swing. I've got balls all over the place now, don't I? Now you're listening. Do you know all of heaven is rooting for you to swing? All of heaven wants you to put your faith into practice. You can stand there with the bat. You can look like a baseball player. You can come to church. You can do everything. But I'm telling you, at some point, did you know you gotta, you got to do something? Did you see what God did with Philip? He put it on a tee for him. He took a ball this big, and all Philip had to do was open his mouth. Look, God has done this for us today. We didn't have enough people to pull off of EBS, and so we met with TLC, and they were like, look, we're kind of limping too. We got people out of town, and so what are we going to do? Well, one of the things that we, at the, at the time that we were talking about, was canceling VBS. And man, I'm talking about there's some hearts breaking in this room. Like, man, we don't really want to do that. But then a guy sent an email. He actually called as well on the phone while we were having the meeting. And he said, we're from South Carolina. We have a team of 30 people. And this is what God called us to do. He's called us to arise and go to help put on kids' events. We are in your area. And look, here's the deal. This is what he said. You don't have to do anything. We bring the hot dogs. We'll bring the bounce houses. And we want to do it all so that your people can interact with the community. We don't want your people having to cook and do things and they can't really interact with people. We'll share the gospel. It'll be an evangelist event. All that we ask you to do is this. Have a place where we could put it on. I was like, I think we can do that. We, ha we have that. Would you agree? And that you would follow up with these people when they come. Just a. I mean, that is a lollipop for our church. So write this date down, okay? July 1st. July 1st. We're going to do it that afternoon, a Saturday. And look, no excuse for our church. All you have to do is just swing. It's been laid out for us to come, invite people. We're going to advertise this. Just make, all you have to do is show up. I think anybody can do that, right? You show up, and we're going to give us our, a swing and interact with the community. And guess what? There will be interracial people that show up from this community. And God and his sovereignty has designed that for us to have a place of black, white, Hispanic, the nations are right around us, and we have that represented in our little sphere right here. And all we got to do is swing. The next commands, the opportunities for us are all around us. God tees it up. If we'll just look, it's right there for us to swing. Well, Philip's going to have a task completed. Look with me in verse 36. It says, now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. So that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Samaria. So let's just ask this question with the task completed. 
well, what's next? If we have done some things and they've already been completed, what do we do now? What's next? Well, for someone that's responded to the, mo- to the gospel of Jesus Christ like this eunuch, you know what his next step was? You see how obvious it was? It's teed up for me. In fact, there's water right here, Philip. What hinders me from being baptized? Well, nothing. Swing. And they go under the water. And that's his first step of obedience. You see what happens next? What had happened for that eunuch? He went on his way doing what? Rejoicing. My goodness, a different man showed back up in Ethiopia than the one who left. Hey, what's gotten into him? He's smiling. He's, where's all this joy coming from? That dude was kind of sour. He frowned a lot. What's up with this guy? He has a testimony. In fact, what he really testified to is, I have a higher authority now than Candace the Queen. I live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then all he has to do is open his mouth. And he has a life that matched the witness coming out of his mouth. What's next for Philip? He's not dead. It says he was caught away. Man, what a transportation that was. I mean, a a miracle in the Bible. How do you get on board with that? Well, you get on board with the very first one, in the beginning, God. And he physically pulls Philip up and removes him and sets him down into the next assignment. And what is he doing? It says he continued preaching. And then all the cities till he came to Caesarea. You see him 20 years later in Acts 21. Listen to verse 8 and 9. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. That's the only other information that you get with Philip. He was preaching, preaching all these cities, and then he landed in Caesarea, and then you see him with a family. He kept arising and going until he got to this place. And then you see four virgin daughters prophesying. What do you think they were prophesying? What do you think they were preaching? Preaching about Jesus Christ just like their daddy. Well, then what? Well, you... Obey these assignments while you're here on earth until God calls you home. The problem is some of us, I think, live like this is home. And so in our latter days, we're not willing to listen. Some of us may set down roots here thinking, all my inheritance is here, when in fact the Bible says your inheritance has been stored up for you in heaven. If you plant your roots here, the Bible says the old heavens and old earth are going to pass away by fire. All your toys, all the stuff you like, gone. But if we lay our inheritance up in heaven, put our treasures there, our heart will be also. Moth and rust don't get it. Thieves don't break in and steal that. And it lasts forever. We can't live like this is our home. And so we obey what's next, what's next, what's next, until God calls us home, wherever we find ourselves in this world, whatever city. What's next for the church? 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Do you know that's the same word used when Philip was caught up, harpazoed. In fact, we bring it across some languages. It's, in English, it's the word rapture, caught up. We who are alive and remain be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. We arise and go. We arise and go. We arise and go. And at some point, a trumpet will blast. When those who have accepted will, when the gospel and the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, the Bible says, And until then, the church is commanded to get the gospel as far and wide as we possibly can, as quickly as we possibly can, and as irresistibly as we possibly can. And we get it out there. And at some point along the way, the trumpet blasts. And then what do we do then? We'll arise and go, and we'll go home. 
What are you doing with your time now? What's next for you? We go about our mission that God has trusted to us to complete. And he'll let us know when it's time. We're going to have a time, a last song here. And as we do, think about that question. Would you ask God this, what's next for me? Just ask him, God, what's next for me? Lots of different people in the audience. If you've never responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ, what's next for you? Hopefully would be you giving your life to Jesus Christ, that you would surrender your life to Jesus as Lord. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He paid the penalty of your sin for you. Having nailed it to the cross, having buried, taken it away, and having risen again, the gospel message is yours if you would receive it. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. For some people, that's a strange command. For some people, that's, that's dumb, preacher. That, that makes no sense. But it's only foolishness to those who are perishing. That word perishing means it has already begun. Did you know the moment you were born, you began to die? The death process had already begun because of sin entered into our world. And that process will continue. And if you don't make a decision to follow Jesus, it will continue. And you will die here on earth. And then after that, the Bible says it's appointed for man to die once. And after that, the judgment. And then you will be judged. And if during that time period you did not give your life to Jesus Christ, you will be found guilty. And you'll experience eternal death, a physical death. A place where God will cast you forever and ever. A place called hell. But that message is foolish to those who are perishing as many times as they might hear it. But what about us, preacher? Look at the last part of that verse. But to us who are being saved... See how that process is happening? There's a moment in time where you're born again. And God begins that sanctifying work, maturing you, testing your faith, growing your faith. And you are being saved. And guess what? On that day, you know what will happen? You will be saved. You will be delivered from the second death. No Christian will see that death. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He so loved the world, he willingly gave his son for you. Do you know that? So that you wouldn't have to experience eternal death. If you would trust in Jesus Christ today as Lord, there's nothing hindering your decision, even from being baptized. You saw two baptisms this morning. There is still water up there. I think it's still kind of warm. We got robes back there for you. I tell you, there's nothing hindering you from being ba even baptized, if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you've trusted him to be your Lord and Savior and King of your life. We put no obstacles in your way today. If your desire is to be baptized, you just come up here and you just tell me, preacher, I'll, I'll swing. I'm ready. God's shown me that's what I need to do. And look, we will make that happen for you. We'll stay around and witness it, won't we? God has a plan for your life. It's a great plan. He has all the background information to why you exist. Some don't even know why they're here. It's not to live 70 years and die. Why am I here? All that background information is revealed to you the moment you trust in Jesus Christ. As you arise and go and walk in him, you will find there's this plan that he had for you from before he ever created the heavens and the earth. And it's being fulfilled in your life as you arise and as you go. There are things you don't have to wonder about. If you're a believer today, you've been baptized, you don't have to wonder about getting involved in the church. You don't even have to ask. That's, that's, that's not background information. That's revealed information. You can get involved in a local church. Find a place to serve the body. You could give your yes to his plan for you. And you could cry out these words. Isaiah said it. Here I am. Don't send an angel. Don't send no other Christian to do my job. Lord, here I am. What's he say? Send me. 
If you don't know, that's a great prayer. You can, you can pray right here today. Whatever God is revealing, however he's speaking to you, would you arise? Would you go? Would you say, here I am. Send me. Let's pray together. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Thank you for the way that you speak through your word. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would help us, give us strength in this room to exercise our faith today, to put our faith in you. That we would walk in the plans that you have for us. That we really would, with all of our heart, pray, here I am. Wherever you would have me go, even if it's desert, may our hearts be found willing to obey. Here I am. Send me. Lord, your very best, being in the center of your will, safest place that we could ever find ourselves, the best place we could ever be. In fact, it's more scarier to be outside of your will than right in the very center. Help us, God, get in the very center of your will, experience your very best. Here we are, Lord. Would you send us for your glory and praise. May the gospel be reached, stretch across and be able to reach the nations through our lives, through our testimony, and through our church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? As God's Spirit's leading and speaking, you obey. If you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, you come and do that. If you want to get baptized today, nothing hindering you, you come and let me know. If you want to come pray a few steps, if it's your desire to join this church, as God's Spirit speaks and leads you, you arise and you go. And that strangeness has a way it's taking care of itself. Would you obey today? May God bless you as you arise and go. As we sing, won't you come?